my Lord. Well, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you that there is no pardoning God like you. There is no one who has mercy so rich and so free. A free gift to us, but purchased at an immeasurable cost. The Lord Almighty, the Son of God, humbling himself, coming down to this world, taking him upon himself human flesh mm. so that he might then take upon himself all our sins and all the judgment of God that our sins deserve. Thank you that you took our sins uh, to the cross and they were buried in the grave with you. And when you rose, you rose glorious, victorious, without sin. And our sins are all left there in the tomb, sealed up forever and ever. And you will never hold a single one of them against us, against anyone who trusts in the Lord Jesus. We pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds and our souls uh, this evening. We pray that you would just give us a fresh vision of the wonders of the Lord Jesus Christ, of being known and loved by him and being able to know and love him as our Lord and our Saviour. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've got to the end of the Song of Solomon. We're, we're looking at chapter 8 and uh, we're looking at the last um, few scenes. Uh, so far, there's been great big long uh, wasafs love poems between the bride and the bridegroom and uh, great big long expositions and now it moves very fast it switches from one to another to another to another to another and uh, if we want to give a theme it's it's where are you looking and 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 in these last scenes we, we see people uh, looking around looking down looking back looking in and looking forward so we, we start with uh, chapter 8 and we see the friends of the bride uh, they are well they're looking around who is this coming up from the desert verse 5 leaning on her lover see there'll be couple of days time see this will be the two of you walking around Amsterdam and uh, you're, you're, you'll have Catherine leaning on you because you're taller and stronger you know and there'll be there'll be people in Amsterdam going oh isn't that beautiful sight <laughs> you might not think it but there will people who be be looking there'll even be some people who are jealous but well here's the picture here, here here's the 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 bridegroom here's Christ pictured in Solomon uh, here's the the bride uh, the church pictured uh, in the woman and they're coming up from the desert towards Jerusalem and uh, and she is leaning on her lover draped around him but it's a picture as well isn't it you know we have a savior who is so strong and so powerful you can lean on him. Mm. Not just cast all your worries on him, but actually lean on him. Mm. Put your weight on him. Mm. And we've got lots of pictures of that through the scripture. Uh, Jesus uh, as the shepherd who leaves the 99 and he goes looking for the one lost sheep. And when he finds it, where does he put it? on his shoulders he carries all the weight of the lost sheep and he says that's the picture of one sinner who repents he comes looking for us he came to seek and to save lost sinners and he picks us up and he puts all our weight on his shoulders you know the the, the christian who's the most secure is the one who leans the most on jesus now, every Christian is secure, but there are some Christians who, well, they just don't seem to panic. They don't seem to flust, get flustered. And it's not because they're stupid and haven't got enough brain power to, to panic or get worried. 
but they know and trust Jesus and they lean on him. Uh, it's in one of J.C. Ryle's book. I think it's in his book, Holiness. And he gives this picture of uh, uh, two people who, who staked land. They claimed land in Australia. And it went, we, we deported all our baddies, didn't we? From the debtors' prisons and murderers and uh, even uh, lots of Welsh guys who tried to... Chartists. The chartists. We, we sent them all off to Australia if we didn't shoot them. And, uh, but they were allowed to, after they'd done their time, they could stay in Australia and they could stake out a claim. And uh, you, you, you were given pegs and uh, as much land as you wanted to peg out to stake your claim, you could do it. And then you would register it uh, in the local um, land registry. Well, there were two men who were on the same ship went to Australia, they did the same amount of time uh, as convicts, and then when they were given their freedom, they both decided to stay, and they both decided to stake a claim on the same day. And they did it. And uh, they were both, after they staked out their claim, they went to the land registry, they made their claim, and they were both given certificates of title. In other words, the land now belongs <coughs> to you. The one guy just got to work straight away. He, he ploughed the land, he planted his crops, he brought in harvest after harvest after harvest, and he became a, a, a pillar of the community and a wealthy farmer. The other guy, even though he got a certificate of title, he was very uncertain. He was always going back to the land registry going, you're not going to take it away, are you? This land is mine, isn't it? You're not going to take it away. It is mine. And he spent so much time worrying about his claim and whether it was really his and whether he'd be able to keep it. He, he hardly did any farming. Now, that's a picture of Christians. The Bible says the moment you trusted in Jesus, you were made a child of God. Your sins were forgiven. They were nailed to the cross with Jesus. They were put in a bag and hurled into the deepest part of the sea and he will never drag them up again and he will never hold them against you. He's adopted you into his family. He's made you a child. You have union with Christ. You are joined to him inseparably and nothing and no one can ever separate you from the love of Christ. And some Christians, they know that, they believe it, they lean their everything, they stake everything on this Jesus, and they prosper. That's biblical prosperity theology. Not prosper financially, but no matter what life throws at them, no matter what the devil throws at them, they know they are secure in Christ. But then there are other believers who just, Worry, 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 worry. Is Jesus big enough for this situation? Have I done enough to, to make him love me? Have I done enough to make him help me? Will he desert me? And they just don't seem to lean on Jesus. They lean on their worries. Nest. Nest, yeah. Had no assurance till the day she died, did she? But here is this beautiful picture. You have... A bridegroom who is almighty. Mm. He's God. Mm. You have a bridegroom who's a man who is touched with the measure of our infirmities. He knows what it's like, not just to be God, but also to be a human being. He knows all your faults, all your failures. Mm. He's known them from all eternity. And he loves you. And he loves me. Mm. And he empathizes with us and you can share the little things and the big things what you think is unimportant what you think is important you can pray little prayers you can pray huge prayers and you can lean your everything on him and he will never ever drop you he will never let you go he will never take you out of his crutch and it's a beautiful picture. And this is a biblical mm. truth inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's giving us pictures that we can picture. We've all seen couples draped around each other. 
mean, sometimes it's a little bit embarrassing, isn't it? You know, <laughs> they're playing tonsil hockey and all sorts, and you know, but but just you know, there's a husband and a wife, you know, and and they've got their arms around each other, and they can have grey hair, and 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 everything life has thrown at them, and they're still together, and they still enjoy each other's company. Well, that's Christ and His church. He enjoys the company of his people and he will never, ever, ever let go of us. And so we can lean our everything on him. So that's the looking around. Now we have looking backwards. This is uh, the bridegroom thinking about the time when he first met his bride. Under the apple tree I roused you, there your mother conceived you, there she who was in labour gave you birth. And and it it seems that that Solomon met his bride was also the place where she was conceived and where her mother gave birth. And and, uh, and he's, he's remembering back. Do, do you like it when someone says, "How did you meet your wife?" How, how did you know you, you go out for a meal with with people and gets the conversation? And say, "How did you meet?" And and you know, very often it can be a wake up call and a reminder, can't it? Because we can we can all take each other for granted. And then when when you're at a meal with friends or whatever, and they say, "How did you meet?" and you're just reminded of. Perhaps it wasn't love at first sight. <laughs> I mean, I, I've got friends who, when they met at uni or whatever, they hated each other. And it was only like a year later or whatever they started to, to like each other and, uh, and then got married. I, mean, I can literally say that the night I met Kim, I wrote in my diary, this is the woman I'm going to marry. Uh, and I was only 20. Oh, she gosh. did not write that in her diary that night. <laughs> But it, it is, it is, it's a good thing, isn't it, to to look back and remind yourself mm. of how you met. I mean, I remember you telling me about the bus, you know, and your husband put put his hand on your lap, and he, you thought he was a dirty old man, didn't you? <laughs> Her words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> There we are. So when you share, when you're having tea and coffee, you can share stories of, of how you how met you your met partner, you. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But here's the wonder. Here is Jesus, who's God, who is from before time. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and he loves to remind himself of the day you met him, of the day he met with you. <clears throat> and saved you. He's been thinking about it for all eternity. The Bible says in Psalm, Psalm 103, you've been loved from everlasting to everlasting. There has never been a moment, even from before time began, even in eternity, when Jesus wasn't looking at you and loving you. And then he was looking forward in eternity to you coming to know him. Now he looks back and he reminds himself. He loves, Jesus loves to dwell on every thought about every one of his people. He loves to remind himself of how you met him, of how he met you. The things he's done in your life, the things you've done for him. He loves to think about you. Um, David knew this. So he writes in Psalm 139, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. How many grains of sand in the world? No one has ever bothered to count them. Absolutely 
var. But of course, now add that to all the grains of sand on Mars and all the, the other planets in the solar system, not just the planets in the solar system, but the planets in our galaxy, and then all the grains of sand in all the planets of all the other galaxies. And David's going, your thoughts about me outnumber all the grains of sand. So, are you accepted and loved because of the number of your thoughts towards Jesus? Or are you loved and accepted because of the number of thoughts of Jesus towards you? Because we don't think about him enough, do we? And here he is reminding himself under the apple tree I roused you. There your mother conceived you. There she who was in labour gave you birth. Now the bride, well, she looks in. Not to her own heart. And, and the, the, her depth of love for her bridegroom. But she looks into the heart of Christ and looks into the depth of his love for her and she says in verse 6 place me like a seal over your heart like a seal on your arm what's she saying well, how do you make a seal? How would they make a seal in, in Jesus' wax. day? Wax. Right. Well, well, it would actually be made of clay or metal, the seal. It would be a ring. Or they'd have a clay seal that would have been imprinted in the wet clay and then hardened. And then you get your wax and you, you push the seal in or you put your ring into the seal and uh, you let the wax go hard. And then you pull the seal out, you pull the ring out, and you've got a perfect impression. And, and what's she saying? She says, seal me into your heart. She's not saying, Jesus, you seal yourself into my heart. She's saying, Jesus, seal me into your heart. <clears throat> And, and this is a beautiful picture uh, all through scripture. Uh, it's, it's done in different ways, but it says that you know, Christ has engraved our names where? In the palms of his hands. You, um, you see, you know, I, th these days I feel very under tattooed because I haven't got any. <laughs> And you walk around, especially on the beach, and especially when it's sunny, and uh, people are tattooed everywhere, aren't they? You know, in, in my day, when I was young, it only used to be greasers and people in the forces who had tattoos. Now, well, you're a loser if you haven't got a tattoo. Yeah. Well, I'm a loser. There we go. And uh, I've got a minister friend who, his first girlfriend when he was at university, he had her name tattooed on his arm. The only trouble is... He didn't marry her. <laughs> he married someone else. So, a bit of a problem there. Every time his wife looked at his arm, there was another woman's name. <laughs> so, he went to the tattoo shop again, and, uh, and he tried to get them to sort of black it out and get her name in there. Oh, it's a real dog's dinner, I tell you. <laughs> you can still see the other name underneath. <laughs> okay, it's not good. It's not good. Do you know, Jesus... He has sealed your name. Your name is engraved in the palms of his hand. Here it says over his heart. Now, we've got a lovely picture of that in the Old Testament with the high priest. Wore an ephod, like an apron, with 12 pockets. And in each pocket was a precious stone. On each one of those stones was engraved one of the names of the tribes of Israel. So over his chest, over his heart were the names of all the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And he would go into the tabernacle, into the presence of God, where you had the table of the bread of the presence, a picture of Jesus. You had the, the lampstand, a picture of the Holy Spirit. And uh, then you had the curtain. And on the other side of the curtain was the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the throne of God. And, and the high priest would go in there and where did he have all the names of God's people engraved over his heart? And he also had two gold shoulder pads. See, it was, you know, shoulder pads weren't just a thing of the 80s. You know, and power dressing. The, uh, the, the high priest had two gold shoulder pads or military epaulets. And uh, on the one were engraved six of the names of the tribes of Israel. On the other shoulder pad was the other six names. And he didn't just have our names engraved mm. over his heart. He carried all of the names of God's people on his Jesus. shoulders into the very presence of God. Mm. It's a beautiful mm. picture. Mm. Remember those days in school? It's not, not so far away for other people, is it? You know, and there, there was that boy or that girl that got your attention. And uh, when I was in school, we still had pencil cases. <laughs> you know? And my first pencil case wasn't even a zippy one. It was a wooden one with the little yeah. slidey top. <laughs> remember those? Yeah. I remember writing underneath the <laughs> lid of the wooden slidey top the name of my first girlfriend, Rachel. I don't even know the story. She didn't know the story. Okay. When I was nine... <laughs> Rachel, <laughs> it was there in blue biro. No one else knew it was there until one day my mum went to empty out my she, Who's this Rachel? She had lived three doors down the road from us. <laughs> Who's this Rachel? And I was like, oh. you know, or are you, are you? Remember having to cover your exercise books? Yeah, you know, yeah. normally the first week in school in September, you had to cover. All your, ex all your books, didn't you? Yeah. You know, with brown paper or wrapping paper or whatever. You know, you had to cover them all. You know, and uh, inside, inside the cover, you're not on the book because, you know, that's got to go back to the school at the end of the year. But, you know, where you've covered it, you might, you might be writing the name of your girlfriend or your boyfriend, you know. Or, or you might get brave, you know, and, uh, and you do it in biro. You do a fake by a row to two on your arm. No one else sees it because you've got your long sleeves on or whatever. But you could rub those off, couldn't you? Well, you take the cover off because you know. we picked up Ruben the other day from school and he goes, I've got a new girlfriend. I've dumped the old one. He's seven. Well, hallelujah. We have a saviour who will never dump his bride mm. because our names are engraved in his heart imprinted in his heart Hallelujah. and on his arm Amen. and then she says love is as strong as death are any of you going to beat death no, no. It's unbeatable, isn't it? Mm. Now, that's what it's saying. Love is as strong as death. It's unbeatable. You can't beat love. That's why there's so many songs written about love. This isn't talking about human love, which is a pale reflection of God's divine love. His love is as strong as death. His love took him to the cross. His love took him into death for me and you. And his love for me and you took him out of the grave on the other side. Love is as strong as death. And we can say love is stronger than death. Because of Jesus' love, he didn't just die for us, but he rose again for us. And he has carried our names in his heart and on his shoulders right into the very presence of God in his Father's house to prepare a place for us, for every one of his people who trust him. 
It's jealousy is, un, is unyielding as the grave. God's love is a jealous love. Do you know any love that doesn't get jealous isn't real love? So a husband whose wife commits adultery and goes, oh, well, easy come, easy go, doesn't really matter. He doesn't really love his wife. L real love is jealous. You, know, you made your vows to me, I made your vows to you, and I expect us to keep them. And if you don't, it hurts me. It's a Real love is jealous. I'm not talking about the love that actually isn't love, that's controlling and wants to know everything a wife's doing and everything she's spending and everywhere she goes and wants to be in control. That's not love. That's not how Jesus is. That's not what it's talking about. But it's talking about faithfulness. You know, a, a husband whose wife's been unfaithful or a wife whose husband has been unfaithful, it hurts because they've invested everything. They've invested their emotions, they've invested their time, they've made them vulnerable, and it's been betrayed. And it hurts. And they weep. And they get depressed. And it's like a black hole. It's one of the worst things I ever have to do as a pastor is to, to counsel couples whose, whose marriages have broken up because of unfaithfulness. It's very hard to regain trust mm. after trust has been broken at mm. such a foundational, heartfelt level. And God says, I am a jealous God. Now, he says that in the context of when he's revealing himself to Israel at Mount Sinai. And he says, do not make any other gods. Don't make images of them. Don't bow down and <clears throat> worship them because I, the Lord, am a jealous God. What's he saying? I love you, and I have saved you. No other God loved you. No other God saved you. I've committed myself to you, and I want you now to be fully committed to me. And I'm jealous over that, because I'm the one who invested everything in saving you. And that's just a little picture in the Old Testament of Christ's much greater, eternal, spiritual salvation. And he says, I, I yearn with a jealous love for my people, for my bride. I am faithful to you and I expect you to be faithful to me. Now, the, now she's looking at it the other way around and she's going, oh, Jesus, I know that you are jealous because you're faithful. You are my saviour. You are my bridegroom. And then the only time God is mentioned in the whole book have you noticed that, that God's actually not mentioned? Now, I'm using the NIV here. It says, um, uh, love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire. Now, in the Hebrew, it does not say it burns like a blazing fire. It says it burns like the flame of the Lord. God's love burns like the flame of the Lord. What? What's the flame of the Lord? His presence, the Shekinah glory. When, when, when God came down and met with Moses in the tabernacle, so everyone would know if it was in the daytime, there would be a huge pillar of cloud. And if it was at nighttime, there would be a huge pillar of fire. And when it was time to move the Israelites on, God would, in the daytime, move as a pillar of cloud. And in the nighttime, he would move as a huge pillar of fire. And here it's describing his love. His love is a red, hot, passionate, burning love for you. Would you describe your love for Jesus as right now? Or is it a little spark? Sometimes you waft it, becomes a little bit bigger. But here's, here's your security and here's my, my security. It's not the strength of your love for Jesus. It's his burning flame of the Lord love for you and me that is our security. His love is red 
hot all the time and has been from eternity <coughs> and will be for all eternity. You can't put a bucket of water on the flaming love of God and douse it. You can't do it. Think of Mount Carmel, which we looked at on Tuesday night in the Bible study, you know. And uh, 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 Elijah has said to all the false prophets, you know, the, the God who answers by fire, he is the Lord. And uh, the sacrifice is there, cut up and put on the altar. And uh, he says, right, I'll give you first go. You know, you can pray to your gods, to Baal and Ashtaroth, and they pray all day. And uh, they start shouting and screaming and cutting themselves. And, uh, and Elijah is ta starts to taunt them. Shout louder, perhaps your de God's death. Uh, shout louder, perhaps your God's gone on holiday. Shout louder, perhaps your God's on the toilet. That's why he's not answering. <laughs> and, and there's no answer. Then Elijah just prays this humble, God-centered prayer. After he's made them go and douse the altar with water three times. And it is absolutely soaked. And what happens fire of the Lord comes down and consumes the water, consumes the wood, consumes the sacrifice. See, water cannot put out the fire of the Lord. It's the fire of the Lord that gets rid of all the water. Now, where did that fire come down? What did it come down on? On the evening sacrifice. When a lamb was put each evening at sunset and the fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. And that's a picture of what happened on the cross. You don't see it, but God's wrath, God's anger, his consuming fire came down and consumed Jesus as the sacrifice for your sins and my sins. His red hot burning saving love for me and you consumed Jesus on the cross, burnt into every molecule of his body so you and I can be saved. So you and I will never go to hell, we'll never experience one negative spark of God's wrath. Many waters cannot quench love Rivers cannot wash it away. If one were to give all his, the wealth of his house for love, literally, he would be utterly scorned. You can't buy love. I mean, there's been a big trial in the, uh, in the papers and on the media all, all last week. Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Two very rich, famous film stars. And they now hate each other's guts. Money doesn't buy love. It's got the houses all around the world. You can fly on private jets and everything else. Money cannot buy love. There is nothing you can do. Nothing you can pay. No price high enough. <coughs> To make Jesus love you. Actually, that's an insult. Imagine if, if Claire turned around and said, Here we are, John. Here's 20 quid. Give us a kiss. <laughs> Here we are. Have my pension. Will, will that make you love me? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Money can't buy love. In fact, you know, rich people are very insecure when it comes to love. Very, very insecure. Because they don't know if that person loves them or loves their money. Mm. They yeah. are very insecure. That's why they get... Prenups. They do prenups yeah. to say that, you know, if you marry me and we get divorced, you get nothing. Yeah. To try and guarantee that that person is... is Marrying them for love, not money. Hey, but, you know, I think there's a lot of chances. Perhaps the court will throw the prenup out or whatever. You know. <laughs> money can't buy love. In fact, God's word says he would be utterly scorned, despised if he thought he could buy love. 
And now we have the chorus of the friends. And, uh, and it seems that the, the bride has been talking about her big brothers and what they've been saying to her for many years. And, and, and the, the, the chorus picks up what the brothers have been saying to her. We have a young sister and her breasts are not yet grown. What shall we do for our sister for the day she is spoken for? Talking about a marriage day. If she's a wall, we'll build towers of silver, literally around her. If she was a door, we will enclose her with panels of silver. What do they say? They're looking down on her. She's just a little girl. She's too young for love. She's too young to fully understand and to fully commit to Solomon, to the king, as her bridegroom. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Typical older brother language. She's too young. She's not ready. We're going to make sure she stays chaste. In the olden days, when knights went off to the Crusades, they'd lock their wife up in a chastity belt yeah. and throw away the key. Well, that's the sort of language here. They say, our little sister, now we, we, we don't think a language like this. You asked John and Pim about the sort of language that Muslims use in the Middle East and in, and in Bethlehem and in Palestine about their younger sisters, what, what the boys of the family, they have got total say-so and control, and they make sure that their younger sister stays chaste, because if she loses her chastity, it is shame on the family, and that's why there are so many honour killings. It's the same language here. She's too young. She doesn't know what she's talking about. We will protect her honour and her dignity and the dignity of the family. That's the language here. So they're looking down on her. You know, when, when youngsters give their lives to Jesus and they're not from a Christian family, do you, know, do you know what the family tend to say? You've been brainwashed. You're too young. You don't know what you're doing. It's the same language. Now listen to the bride. I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. Oh, we, we find this language difficult, don't we? Uh, hey, we? Thus I have become in his eyes like one bringing contentment. She goes, no, I'm old enough. I, I, you know, I, I haven't got breasts like little fried eggs, like a little girl. You know, I'm a grown woman, and I, I'm old enough, and I know what I'm doing. Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Harmon. He let it his, out his vineyard to tenants. Each was to bring for its fruit a thousand shekels of silver. But my own vineyard. I remember that the bride sometimes is pictured as a garden. Sometimes she's pictured as a vineyard. This is a picture of herself. My own vineyard. What does she say? Is mine to give. I am old enough, I know what I'm doing, I know that Jesus loves me and he's died for me and he's forgiven me and given me eternal life and I'm old enough to trust him and follow him and give my life to him. And, and she even puts it in money terms. She says, my own vineyard is mine to give. The thousand shekels are for you, O Solomon, and 200 are for those who tend for it. She's wealthy. She's got her own vineyard. And she rents it out to tenants. They get 200 shekels a year. And a profit is a thousand shekels. And she says, that all belongs to my bridegroom. She's not just saying, I'm old enough. She's saying, I am totally consecrated to Jesus. Everything that I am and everything I have belongs to him. It's a weird trend these days. I, I can't get my head around it. When people get married, they still have separate bank accounts. That's not commitment. Commitment. 
What's mine is mine, what's yours is ours. That's how some Christians are, you know. I'll give to Jesus my leftovers, but everything else is mine. And that's not biblical. Biblical view of a real disciple, of someone who belongs to Jesus, says, all that I am and all that I have are now his. That's what the wedding vows are. With my body I honour thee. All that I have I give to thee. It's the same picture. It's a total commitment and consecration. And this is a real Christian. The Bible says in Colossians, everything was made by Jesus and for Jesus. Everything you have, everything you are, is not yours. It's his. Yes, he gives you loads of stuff. But do you know what you're meant to do? You're not meant to go, mine! You're not meant to do it. I'm not meant to do it. We're meant to say, thank you, Jesus. And we receive it with open hands. Do you know the, the big test in, is then, is that you keep it with open hands, always looking for opportunities to pass those blessings on to others so that you and I can honour the name of Jesus. And, and that's what she's talking about. She says, my, my vineyard, all the prophets, a thousand shekels. They go to my husband. They go to my bridegroom. Because I know I, he can, I can trust him. Now, what are Christ's last words to his bride in this book? If you were, if you were the Holy Spirit and, and you were writing a book of the Bible about the relationship between Christ the bridegroom and his church believers, the bride, what would you write as the last words of Jesus in a book to believers? That's a rhetorical question. Okay, you haven't, you haven't got to answer it. Well, look at what he does. Look at the words he chooses, are chosen by God's Spirit. So this is Christ speaking. You who dwell in the gardens, which is his bride, with friends in attendance, let me hear your voice. That's the last thing that Christ says to his bride in this book. Let me hear your voice. Do you ever think, oh, he's so busy, there's so many other Christians in the world, you know, why would he bother listening to me? I, I'm such a poor Christian, I, I let him down in so many ways. Why would Jesus listen to me? I don't know how to pray like other Christians. I remember just having got saved, going to my first ever prayer meeting in a church, sitting there, and I'm like, they're all quoting hymns in their prayers. I didn't even know any hymns. They're all quoting they verses in their prayer. Christians. They're praying about the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. And I'm sat there, and I, you know, I'm, I'm 27 years old. I'm a big rugby player, you know. Nothing, nothing frightens me on the rugby pitch, and I am terrified of praying, because like, I can't pray like them. And I'd be there, you know, week after week, rehearsing. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll pray that. And then someone else would pray it and go, oh, well, stuff that. Well, then that one's gone. I can't pray that because <laughs> someone else has prayed it. You know, and it, it was weeks and weeks. And then this dear, dear old believer, Mildred, she'd had both her legs amputated. And uh, she was a lovely believer. And, and she came to me at the end of a prayer meeting one, one week. And uh, she said, you know, why do you come to a prayer meeting and, and don't pray? I said, what do I do? I can't pray like everyone else. And, and even when I'm, I'm rehearsing what to pray, other people pray it. So I think, well, there's no point of praying that anymore. And she went, well, do you find it easy talking to me? I said, yeah, yes. you're, you're lovely, Mildred. She went, Jesus is a million times more lovely. Just talk to him like you talk to me. Just start speaking to him, telling him how much you love him, thanking him for his love. It was liberating. Listen to Jesus speaking to you. This is the last words he will say to you from this book. Let me hear your voice. Oh, but my voice. I, even I don't like listening to my voice. Do you, do you like listening to your voice on a recording? 
you know, you record yourself on a mobile phone or, or on your answer phone. Oh, my word. No. I, I, I think my diction is quite clear. And then I, I hear myself speaking back and go, oh, Merv, yeah, you really did break your nose. You know, and I've still got that East Midlands twang there mixed with a little bit of Welsh and a little bit of Hindi. And, oh, I hate the sound of my voice. Oh, Jesus, my voice is all croaky. I've got hay fever. Jesus, I've got a sore throat. Jesus, I don't know what to say. Jesus, my, my words just seem, so, my prayers just seem so small and so unspiritual. What does Jesus say to you? Let me hear your voice. Remember what he said in chapter 2? It's even more amazing. Chapter 2, verse 14. Show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet. I bet Stephen, you would never describe your voice as sweet. No. Jace, would you say your voice is sweet? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was a dangerous question. It's always us, wasn't it? <laughs> Glenis, do you like the sound of your voice? No. No. <laughs> do, do, do you like the sound of your voice? No. Nah, it's just just sounds so wrong, doesn't it? Yeah. What does Jesus say? Let me hear your voice, because to my ears, your voice is sweet. Uh, when we were separated, um, I was in Nepal and Kim was in India, and uh, I couldn't get the visa and everything. Um, it was just so lovely to talk to her on the phone mm -hmm. each night and to hear her voice. Why? Because her voice is the best voice in the world. No, it's not. Why do I? Because it's got a funny Welsh accent. Welsh accent. Because <laughs> she's from the Ebervale Valley. I mean, when when I was playing rugby for Cross Keys, you know, we played all all the mainly all the teams up and down the the Ebervale Valley. I could tell where someone lived in her valley <laughs> because the accent changes from Ebervale all the way down to Newport. It's very distinguishable. How far, I can tell a Newbridge accent from a Kumkarn accent. They're different. <laughs> different. I can tell them. No, it's not that she's got a Kumkarn accent. That's not why her voice is sweet. Her voice is sweet because I love her. Why is your voice sweet to Jesus? Because he loves you. He loves you with a passionate love. He loves you with a red hot flaming love. He loves you with a love that cannot be quenched by waters. He loves you more than his own life. And he laid down his life for you. So you can be in a relationship with him. So you will trust him. So you will want to talk to him. So you will want to praise him. And he says your voice is sweet. Let me Hear your voice. Yeah, he is much more willing to listen to your voice than you are to speak to him. Otherwise, he wouldn't have to say it. Now, what's the last words of the bride? Well, the, the bridegroom is looking forward. He's saying, let me hear your voice. Speak to me again. Speak to me again. What's the last... Words of the bride. Well, this is easier because the last words of the bride in the Song of Solomon are also the last words of the bride in the Bible. Come, my lover. In Revelation, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Why has Jesus died for your sins? Why has Jesus forgiven you? Why has he adopted you into his family? Why does he walk with you? Why has he put his spirit within you? Why does he say, I will never leave you and never forsake you? Why does he say, I will shield you all the way to heaven? Why has he done all that for you? Because he's coming again to be with his bride forever. And he will wipe away every tear. And he will take away all sickness. And he will take away all pain. And he will take away all guilt. 
and he will take away all shame and he will take away every lingering barrier and obstacle there still is between you and him in a perfect relationship. Mm. He's coming again to take it all away and to be with you forever in the new heavens and the new earth, the home of the righteous. And they will never, ever, ever let anything then come in and break that. Because Satan and all his minions and all evil will have been thrown into the lake of fire forever. And the more you know the love of Christ, the more you know the wonder of his presence, the more you long to be with him because that's what it's all about come in the NIV come away my lover this away is not there in the original come my lover be like a gazelle or like a young stag come quickly bounding over the mountains over all the obstacles come quickly what's Jesus's last words in the Bible yes or even so I am coming soon. There's encouragement. I'm coming. What if you die before Jesus comes again? But he's still coming for you. That was his promise to his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms or many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with myself. Do you know a Christian never dies alone? How could we? I've got a bridegroom. We said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But you can lean on me. And your name is engraved in my heart. And I love you with a red hot passion. And waters cannot quench it. That's what everything I've ever done is about. It's about coming and taking you to be with myself forever. I listen to John Murray. Yeah, this is in his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. Okay. It's, it's a little bit wordy. But, oh, it's full of such wonderful, wonderful truths. It is essential for the Christian to recognise that there is an intelligent mysticism in the life of faith. It is a life of living union, being joined with Jesus, and communion with the exalted and ever-present Redeemer. He communes with his people and his people commune with him in conscious, reciprocal love. The life of true faith cannot be that of cold, mental assent. In other words, Christianity is not just about knowing biblical truth. That's just cold, dead orthodoxy. The truth is important. Because without truth, you just have idolatry. The life of true faith cannot be that of cold mental assent. True faith must have a passion, a warmth of love and communion. Because communion with God in Christ is the crown and ultimate goal of Christianity. He's coming again. Yeah. What for? To take his bride to be with himself. You know, when you get married, you don't live in separate homes, do you? No. Not if it's a real marriage. I mean, it might be a fake marriage to get someone a passport. Real marriage, you forsake your mother and father and you are joined to your husband and wife and the two become... One, and Paul says, I'm talking about a great mystery here. I'm talking about Christ and his church. Your bridegroom is coming. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he's coming for you. How will I recognize him? Don't worry, he'll recognize you. Mm -hmm. He's loved you from before time began. You were chosen in Christ from before the creation of the world. He was the lamb prepared to be slain for you before the creation of the world. He's coming for his bride. He's coming for you. And nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And as good as your marriage is, as wonderful as your love is with your husband and your wife, or your mum and dad to you as a daughter or a son, that is a pale reflection, because we were made in God's image. That is a pale reflection of God the Father's love for his children mm. and of Christ's love for his bride. Death can separate us in our marriages, but death can never separate us from our heavenly bridegroom that takes us to be with him, absent from the body, present with the Lord, which is better by far. This is just the dress rehearsal for the real thing with Jesus. Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, forgive me where I've, I got in the way and made it complicated and obscured uh, your wonderful love for us. But, oh, Holy Spirit, uh, please come and imprint these glorious truths on our hearts. And, oh, we praise you, Lord, that, that our names, that ourselves are imprinted on your heart. Mm -hmm because you love us. You've engraved our names on the palms of your hands and you will never, never, never let us go. We praise you and thank you. Amen. Amen.